morning, Calvary. Good to have you with us again. Come and worship the Lord together. Know that this has been a unique time and we continue to have the opportunity to share God's Word this way. And hopefully you're able to not only listen to it yourself, but maybe share this contact with someone else. Uh, You can share the link. And so that would make an opportunity to spread the gospel message around. As we continue to think through this time, continue to be in prayer for one another. Right now, this is a time where we need to hold up Michael and Colleen marriage. Michael's father passed away, and so continue to pray for Mike and Colleen uh, as they wrestle through this time. Um, Also, I'd actually ask you to remember to pray for our missionaries. Our missionaries are uh, all of them in different fields, and so different countries all have different rules, but they're all facing the same type of things that we are. Some of them are quarantined, some of them are able to get out, some of them are not able to get out at all, and then others are making decisions, is it wise to even be there? Darcy's sister is making that decision there in India, should she come back? And so a lot of details that need to go on to make these things happen into wise decisions. So I just ask you to pray for one another and pray for those like our missionaries on the front line. Let's stop and have a word of prayer before we worship together. Heavenly Father, we stop and we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. As we stop to think about all the, the turmoil and struggles that we have, the reality is you have covered it all. You have, with your death, burial, and resurrection, you've defeated the sin and you've defeated death that brings us on. Oh, we haven't fully experienced it until we are in glory, but right now, Lord, we have confidence in you. So give us the hope and give us the courage to hold on to you and to recognize that you are in control. Lord, we do pray for uh, Mike and Colleen. We love them. Sweet people that have served you for years. So we ask, Lord, that you would just pick them up and hold them up and allow us to do the same for them. In this time of distance where they hurt and we want to be close, uh, give us the right things to do and the right words to say. Lord, for our missionaries, whether they are in Europe, whether they are in India, whether they are in Japan, other areas, all places we find out have been affected by this. It's that pandemic. So Lord, we just pray that you would help uh, give them wisdom, give them peace and contentment. Uh, We at least have family we can talk to and see or visit with, and they don't have that when they're out on the front lines there. So encourage them and pick them up now, we pray. We are here to hear from you. So Lord, speak through your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's spend some time worshiping in song together. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus fled and died for me I see his word his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance Messiah still in all who oh, praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord Oh, Lord, I'll go. 
Recently turned 89 years old. The church was born on March 31st, 1931. So belated happy birthday. The church, not Calvary, but church in whole, the universal church, was actually born on Pentecost. This year, Pentecost falls on May 31st. So that will be our birthday as a church, the universal church. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So if you count when Passover took place this year, today is 15 days into this 50-day Pentecost period. Uh, we first know this date or this term as the Feast of Weeks. In uh, the Hebrew, it's Savat. In 
the English, it's weeks, and in Greek, it's Pentecost. So in Acts, it's the first time we read about Pentecost, the, the term used there. It was on this day that God gave birth to the church. Every birth is amazing, but I can just imagine this birth was something else. When God um, encouraged them all to be in this one area, resting in this one spot, and then the, the, the Spirit of the Lord descends down, sits on each of them. It says tongue-like figures were above their heads as they, they all of a sudden were baptized in the Spirit, and they began to speak in languages that they had never spoken in before. That would have been amazing. What we read about this is that the time frame of when this happened is during this Feast of Weeks. Acts chapter 2 verse 5 tells us that what was taking place is everyone was coming in because of this festival. They're supposed to come for this feast, the uh, Feast of Weeks. And so they were devout Jews from all over the area with all different kinds of languages. That's why when that church was first born, they spoke in a variety of languages. And you read that in Acts chapter 2 where it says this country and this country and this country. They all heard for the first time the gospel in their own language. What God was doing is God was giving this jump start to this church. God was introducing this new thing, this new direction, this new plan he had called church. And he empowered the church to act. I don't know if you remember, but it was in June of this year, I began a series on the book of Acts called Empowered to Act. We covered the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. What we looked at is we understood that the picture was that he, he empowered them with the Spirit of God to do some miraculous things and to act on his behalf. What were they supposed to do? Well, we were find out. You will be my witnesses. That's it. What was the action? Tell people about me. Now, if you take the book of Acts and you divide it, and that's what we did for the study, the first 12 chapters were the empowered to act, and, and you read a lot about signs and wonders, the miracles that took place, whether it's the speaking in tongues or the healings or the uh, even resurrections that took place. There were some things that went on. There was a lot of things, and, and the, the comment we hear is many signs and wonders is what they did. So the, the first half was this empowerment. The second half of Acts continued to be empowered. Just like the first half of Acts, they continued to talk about Jesus. That was the job. But it seemed like the focus was a little bit on the empowering. The second half, they still have that power. But the emphasis is now on the message. The fact that they are taking Jesus to the world. Our job is to take Jesus to the world. We're stuck at home right now. It would love to be able to go out and do a bunch of stuff, and so you can't travel. So let me take you on a biblical trip. We're going to go around the world, or at least the European part of the world, the Middle East area. We're going to go through with Paul and travel around and try to find the different locations, the different cities that he was in, and how he took Jesus to the world. By the way, this is not just Paul's job. This is our job. We call it the Great Commission. Yes, this is our job, to be taking Jesus to the world. I'm going to walk through a study on the book of Acts, the second half, beginning in chapter 13. And today we're going to be in chapter 13. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to chapter 13. I'm going to give you a couple of tools that are going to help you with that as well. I found it to be very helpful for me in my study to just kind of follow it with a map. Here's a map of the area, and as the city was taken, uh, was named in the scripture, I followed it all the way through to see where did Paul travel. So in your notes, uh, in the bulletin notes, you're going to have a little reference also right here. Here is a web page that you can turn to that you will be able to find the map and this link gives you to uh, the first 
Paul journey. There are multiple Paul journeys or Paul's missionary journeys. This is the first one. So I encourage you, if you, if you look on your website, on, on our page, you can probably click right to it and be able to go straight to it from there. Or you can write down this very long number or very long page and go to it any other way you'd like to. Paul ended up with three different trips um, as well as his final return to Rome. Let me also give you the outline of the book of Acts. I took and kind of just um, have been reading through this the book of Acts uh, in my little home study there and, and writing down different things and have pages of just what did I see? How did I break down this, ch- this book? So here's an outline. Paul's first missionary trip uh, is chapters 13 and 14. Uh, then there's, he comes back and there's a council of Jerusalem. The council basically was saying, uh, can they really be followers of Jesus Christ? And so the, the council of Jerusalem, we'll get to that in our study, chapter 15. Halfway through chapter 15, we, we find the second missionary trip goes on, goes on through chapter 18, partway through. Paul comes back from that second missionary trip, not there very long before he begins the next missionary trip. Each time he kind of seems like he comes back to the same area, reports what's going on, and heads out. He returns back finally after chapter 26, excuse me, chapter 21. Um, And as he comes back, the uh, ministry that Paul takes place there in Jerusalem, and he's We see him hanging in this area and a little bit more time given just to that ministry in Jerusalem. What's interesting as you read through this is that they said, don't go back to Jerusalem. It's not going to be good. And he said, I know. Don't go back there because you're going to be arrested. I've got visions. And do we have a lot of people giving him these visions that are going to take place? Instead, he decides, his statement is, I'm ready to give up my life for the Lord if I need to. And so he heads back to Jerusalem. There, just as they said, he is arrested placed on trial, and then shipped back to Rome. Were any of those things a bother to Paul? It wasn't because Paul, uh, God told Paul early on, you're going to go to Rome. So he said, if they arrest me and take me to Rome, I'm just following the Lord's plan. There you have a little outline, so we'd like to be able to let you walk through that outline. Hopefully that will give you a little bit more of how we're going to go. You might take that outline as well as these maps and make some copies of it so that over the time as we're studying it, you'd be able to pull those together. Some have given an even broader outline of the book of Acts. The first eight chapters would be ministry or the gospel in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12 is the gospel in Samaria. And chapters 13 to 28 is the gospel to the ends of the world. They took Acts 1.8 and used that as the outline for how we're going to see that. Well, this is exactly what happened. He said, you'll be ministers, you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. Well, Jerusalem, Judea area is the first, and then Samaria area, and then the ends of the world. So that's another little outline if you'd like to be able to use that. Your assignment today is going to be uh, to read through Acts chapter 13. There's a lot of verses, so I'm not going to take the time to read all of those verses, but we're going to cover all of that territory today. I think if you begin to look at that and, and read it together as a family, you'll be able to get a bigger picture of what's taking place. While you're reading this, here's what I want you to look for, transition. Chapter 13 is a transition chapter. I'll explain that. Um, What's happening is we're going from the Jewish community to the Gentile community with the gospel message. Let me just begin with the first three verses of Acts chapter 13. Now there was in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menain, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then they fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, and sent them off. Now I mentioned it's a transition chapter. This is one of the first times that we see a missionary commissioning service 
Often people have used this as a missionary is commissioned. Here's what they did. If you remember, when we've commissioned some of our missionaries that have gone out from Calvary Baptist Church, we brought them up here, we laid our hands on them, we prayed over them, and we sent them out. We took it right from this passage. And the picture is, it's not just a home gospel, but it's taking Jesus to the world. That's what we're called to do. But I want you to see this transition. The transition is that Paul used to always be at the Jewish community. What he would do is he would always go in, he would go to the synagogue, and from there we see the ministry, because of the rejection, goes now to the Gentiles. Let me show you some things. You have your Bibles, open it up, and let me just kind of walk through. Verse 5, it says at the very end of verse 5, they proclaim the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. Okay, we're still focusing on the Jewish community. Verse 14, uh, and on the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue and sat down. Okay, still in the Jewish community. Uh, Then he addresses them, uh, verse uh, 16, men of Israel, talking to the Jewish community, verse uh, 28, brothers, sons of Abraham, we know this is the focus of the, uh, the message. And finally, verse 43, many Jews and divert converts of Judaism uh, followed Paul and Barnabas. So the ministry we could see, he's talking to the Jews, he's talking to the Jews, he's talking to that community. And at this point, we see the transition. What brings the transition? Well, verse 45. But there were Jews, when the Jews saw the crowds, were, uh, the crowds they were filled with jealousy. Okay, the leadership, when he's talking about the Jews, I know it's kind of confusing because we have the same term used both times. We're talking about the leadership of the Jewish community came in and saw what was happening, and they were thinking, we're losing these people to this Paul guy, to this new thing, Jesus Christ, whoever he is, that one that we just crucified. We're going to lose people to this person. And so they're now pulling back, and they are filled with jealousy because people were wanting to hear what they had to say. So look at how Paul responds. Here's a transition verse, verse 46. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Stop there. Who's the you? The Jewish community. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. There's the transition. What we, we see the way God works through all of this is transition to Satan. I'm, I'm going to have a global mission. It's not just Jerusalem, Judea, but it's to the ends of the earth. It's everywhere. Romans chapter 11, Paul writes Romans again. And so Paul kind of outlines it here in Romans chapter 11. When he says that same thing, he, he kind of tells them what takes place. This, in, in the book of Romans, that is around the transition time, where what we see in the book of Romans, the first part of the book is, here's what you need to know, here's what you need to know. And he ends around chapters 9, 10, and 11. He says, but I got to tell you what. The gospel that was given to the Jews is now given to the Gentiles. Why? Well, he tells us why. Verse 1 says, I'm flipping through my Bible quickly to try to get there. Verse 1 says, Ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So what they know is that the, the gospel's turned But it's not turned completely away from them. We still have Jewish uh, brothers and sisters who have come to know Jesus Christ. They're often called completed Jews. They're part of the promised people. And so, yes, we still have those that are being saved. Verse 17 says this, uh, verse 7 of chapter 11, Romans chapter 11. Israel failed to obtain what they were looking for. The rejection obtained, uh, they... they, uh, They rejected it, and so the elect obtained it. Who are the elect? The Gentiles that were grafted into the root. So what we have in Romans chapter 11 is an explanation, again, of what is taking place in this verse right here. 
is that the Israelites chose to say, no, we don't want your Jesus. We don't want that message. We want our old system. We like our old system. And Paul and Barnabas then transitioned to ministry to say, we will go from them to now the Gentile group. You just have to wonder if this is all part of God's plan, the way he does this. The plan was at the beginning to say, go into the all of the world. It's persecution that actually moved them out of Jerusalem. It appears that they felt very comfortable in the upper room, huddled together. We've got it. We know what we're going on. And persecution scattered the church all over. Well, now they're into other parts and they're reaching Samaria. And now the rejection among the Jews, even in Samaria, has pushed Paul out even further. Rejection allows it to go to the entire world. So what's his plan? Well, the plan was set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. The rest of the book of Acts kind of follows the ministry through one man's ministry. It's the, the plan or this global evangelism through one man's ministry, the man Paul. Now, we know he's a pretty important man in the Word of God. But it is only one man's ministry. And then what we have is the churches that he goes to, we see him writing letters. And that's why we have all the different letters, whether it's the letter to the Corinthians or the letter to the Philippians or the letter to the Colossians, Thessalonians. All of these are specific letters or specifically to people like Titus, the pastor of a church and uh, pastor of the church of Corinth where he said, stay here and help them. Or Timothy who pastored the church of Ephesus for a while. He said, stay there and help them. So we see Paul, all the, the rest of this is the ministry of God through one man's eyes. But you need to know it's not a ministry of one man. It's a ministry of all of us. It's a ministry to all believers. You and I have given that, been given that same commission to go share the gospel. Your neighborhood is your mission field. Your place of work is your mission field whenever you get a chance to get back to it. No one else has the context that you have and God has blessed you with the gospel and he wants you to take that gospel to wherever you are going. You are to take Jesus to the world. Do you remember Donnie's instructions for us on Monday? The devotions he gave? Go make disciples. What he was doing is he was bringing this commission. He was bringing this charge that he knows that's our job. And he's right. It's God's plan. We must be ready to take the message. We're also told be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks you and open up the conversation for those that don't ask you. The job is take Jesus to the world. Reading through here, there are some lessons that I learned, and so I want you to pull those up in your notes there. What lessons can we learn from this? First lesson, God calls people from all walks of life. The, the gospel is about people. It's not about programs. It's not what do we do. It's, it's not even about the churches. It's about people. The people is what make up the church. In my reading through here again, I was amazed at the number of different people that are listed by names. Some we know nothing else about other than they were recorded at this time in this scripture. Like Menea, here's a unique walk of life. He's a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and he's a believer? Herod worked pretty hard against the church, but now one of his lifelong friends comes to know Jesus Christ as a Savior and is a teacher in the church of Antioch. Or Barnabas. Barnabas, we first are introduced with Barnabas when he sells a piece of land and brings the money and says, I want to help other people. I, I know there's a lot of needs right now and I have some resources, seem to be a man of, uh, of wealth, and he brought this land. Let me take this. So we, we have another person, maybe a man of wealth. Then we have this man named Saul. Well, later he's called Paul. That's how we know him. What do we know about him? Well, he made a kind of a big about face, didn't he? Here he is against God, against Jesus Christ. He would call himself for God, but it was his own God or the God that they 
would worship, but he was against Jesus Christ, and now he becomes a follower and a teacher of Jesus Christ. Simeon and Lucius, we don't even know who they are. We're not given much information. There's some traditions about them, but Scripture doesn't tell us anything about these unknown individuals. In verse 7, we read about this Sergius Paulus, proconsul. Well, who's that? He's, uh, he's the governor. Verse 12, we find out this governor that first hears this message is intrigued, and in verse 12, he believes. What we see is God calls people from all different walks of life, Jews, Gentiles, wealthy, poor. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And then he tells us, take this gospel message all over the world. No one is outside the reach of his grace. We're all called to give this message. What is the message? All right, let's come back to our text and find out what message did he give. When Paul was asked, jump to verse uh, 28. Here's the message he gave. And when they found him, Paul is talking about Jesus Christ, and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that is written of him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. So what's the message? Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Paul later writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a first importance. Here's what you need to know. The first thing, that Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. He continues to teach. That's the message that we have. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. What did that accomplish? Well, keep reading. If we read all the way up to verse 38, through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. So here's the simple part of our message. Jesus Christ came, lived the sinless life, died for us, buried for us, rose again for us, and in Jesus Christ is forgiveness of sins. That's the message we take everywhere. That's the message at the very beginning Jesus said, you're going to be witnesses of me. What do we tell them? I died, buried, rose again. Forgiveness of sins is found in me. That's Paul's message. That's your message and my message. That's what we need to tell our neighbors, our family, our friends, our co-workers. This is the message. It's also the message that you and I need to hold on to. We need to believe in ourselves. But as you bring the message, another thing I see in this chapter is there will be opposition. Chapter in verses 8 through 11 so I'm giving you an overview because you're going to read this later on with your family. Verses 8 through 11, we have this magician, Elimus, who opposes them as he's talking to this governor and he's sharing that he's probably mocking everything or opposing everything that they're trying to do. How does Paul handle that? Well, Paul silences him very quickly. He actually makes him go blind. And so this man that's opposing now walks away blind. In verse 45, we find another one where we see that the, the Jews opposed Paul. And so when they opposed him, he walks away. Then we come down to verse 48. It says that he walked away, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying God for the word that the Lord for many as we're appointed to enter eternal life, and the word of the Lord was spread throughout the whole region. Um, what we see again coming through here is rejection. When the rejection happened by the Israelites, the Gentiles were the benefactors. It's the transition time. It's a transition chapter. He wants you and me to know what he has and to believe it and to share it. Um, I jumped ahead of my notes. Sorry, no wonder it wasn't making any sense to you. It wasn't making sense to me. If you jump back to verse 50, but the Jews incited uh, the devout women and the high standing of the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. So the opposition. We first have this magician that's an, uh, 
opposing them. We have the Jews that are opposing them. We have more opposition driving them right out of the area. How do you handle opposition? Do you collapse? Uh, look at how they handled uh, the opposition, 51 and 52. They shook off the dust from their feet against the, uh, them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Is there something that made them stop? No, they did not quit. Even though the message was rejected, they said, all right, let's, let's go somewhere else. Let's tell someone else. Why? Because our job is not to save anyone. We can't. Our job is to tell everyone we should. That's what we had to do. We can't save. That's God's job. He's the one who works through that. How do we know who they are? Well, God will draw some to himself. God always draws some to himself. Whether in chapter uh, 13 here, verses 7 and 12, we find out is Sergius Paulus, okay, the governor, yep, there he calls some to himself. Whether in verse 43, many Jews and devout uh, and con devout converts of Judaism followed, whether it's that group or whether it's the Gentiles who believed and received eternal life. God always has his converts. God is always drawing them. It's your and my job to just be witnesses. That's still our job today. Take Jesus to the world. How are you doing on your part of the job? Taking Jesus. When can we stop? Well, let me kind of give you the picture. Again, if we start this whole section, we start it in chapter 13. And what we find is Paul, at this time he's called Saul at this chapter. Saul is called, verse 2, separate for me Saul for the work that I've called him to do. And then we find out what his work is. And he does it. When does he stop? Turn to the very last verse in the book. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. He lived there. This is Saul again, now Paul. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the close of the book. So when did Paul stop? According to this book, he didn't stop until God stopped him. So my encouragement to you, take Jesus to the world. Don't stop. Even if others don't want to hear it, turn to go somewhere else. Don't stop until God stops you. Our job according to this passage, start at the very beginning of the book. Be my witnesses. Take it to the ends of the world. I don't live in Jerusalem or Judea or anywhere close. I live in a Gentile nation. I am part of the ends of the world. And so my neighborhood is the ends of the world, and I have the opportunity to share this great message, Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, the forgiveness of sins of Jesus Christ around the world or in my neighborhood. Where's your neighborhood? How are you doing in the job of taking Jesus around the world? Let's stop and ask God to give us the strength to do it. Heavenly Father, we again come to you and just say thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for opening my eyes and letting me see this. We read in this chapter again that you say you saved all those that were selected, elected for salvation. Amazing. I have no idea who that is. You do. All I know is I got to just share the message. So Lord, help me to continue to do that. Thank you that you allowed me to know and open my eyes. Now, Lord, help me to be an obedient servant like Paul, like Barnabas, like others that have gone before me, and share Jesus Christ around the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen.